Hi and welcome to another episode of Wine and Wisdom. I'm Thomas Le Huang and you're listening to the TL podcast where knowledge is shared and no one takes themselves too seriously. Let's go, boys. Um, let's get into the next one. First of all, what's the wine? I've got to finish. Oh, well, you better Hurry hurry, up. mate. So, Chris, o, the Chris, floor is yours, you mate. were on this week, right? We have to try and beat yours, but you on with the special one. So this is from my good mate Dan's. This is a Grant Birch from the Barossa, South Australia. This is uh, one of their limited releases called Shadrach. It's a Cab Sav, 2016, so it's not very old. It's only got about five years on it, but I've got high hopes for this wine. I think it's going to be an absolutely outstanding wine. Okay, all right. Let's try it then. Let's see how we <coughs> Oof. Okay. Mm, Colour. Mm. Smell. So because I picked the person we're talking about, it is above the $50. I think it was, I think it was about $100. And odd dollars. I thought so the rules would have to be above 100 Cheers. Yeah, Cheers, boys. boys. Cheers. Okay. Oh, that's good. Okay. Maybe a good second. It's almost <laughs> as good as my Chardonnay, mate. Well done. <laughs> You're getting closer. <laughs> no, it's, oh, that's bloody good. All right. So let's have a look at um, RBG. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. For those of you who don't know, she was a Supreme Court judge and he yeah. passed away last year. Yeah. You know in what? America. In America. Yeah, she's obviously in America. Yeah. It was my turn to pick and I, I, I was thinking, why did I pick her? And I thought, but I thought we needed to speak about more women. Uh, on the show because we yeah. always pick, we picked three guys, so I thought I wanted to change it up a little bit. But I think from the little I knew of her, and I was very interested to find out more. It, it impressed me what I heard, so that's I thought this would be a good way to find out for myself what, what this lady was about. She was nicknamed Notorious RBG because uh, of her, her stance against uh, discrimination. Initially, it was against women, but uh, any discrimination in the end. She died. She was eighty seven. Three. Think. 83? 87. That's what I thought, 87. Yeah. Just testing you, boys. Come she on. Th- she was Come born on. in 1933 and died last year in September. She's a Supreme Court judge. Mm-hmm. Um, she was only a very short person. She was only five foot tall. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was a very timid and very shy person. Yeah. But when she spoke, everyone shut up. And she really knew what she was talking about. She's taller than TL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. But just by two inch, mate. You can't. You can't. That's not <laughs> much taller. The irony of uh, you picking her and saying you did it because we haven't talked about any women yet is that she would have done exactly the same bloody thing from what I've read about her. Right. She was, her first championing was for gender equality and equal rights for women. So That's right. That's but, where, but where was it was interesting for me is that she actually became renowned by defending a man. And that's and that's what I'm going to get into. That's, and that's, that was that's, a, that was a second that was a second that's main. Right. That was a but second no, main. But that's the one that really brought her to the main forum. Well, that, that, that actually was, I think, a very calculating move on her behalf to take that because she could see the outcome changing the uh, structure of the judicial system all throughout America. Yeah. Before we get into that, she was um, she was married, high school sweetheart, had a baby before they started at Harvard. Her husband had started a couple of years before her. Um, then she went in and started at Harvard. They had a 14-month-old baby when she started studying law. Husband were three years above her. During that period, uh, her husband... Got c- ill, yeah. yeah. testicular yeah. cancer. Yeah. And back then it was like huge amounts of radiation. So she was actually looking after the kid, looking after her studies, also gathering notes from all his colleagues, retyping them for him to study, helping him with his studies. She'd sleep for about two hours a night. They reckon that's what helped her learn to burn the candle at both ends. She went on to... He, he recovered, um, and they actually ended up having a, a long, long marriage until he passed away in 2010. Yeah. yeah. He he was actually end up becoming one of New York's uh, best tax attorneys, tax uh, lawyer. But when she was in, uh, in Harvard... She actually achieved a point that her husband was spruiking her name, said, my wife is going to be in the Harvard Law Review. And what that is, is the top 25 students of every year out of 500-odd people get nominated in this Harvard Law Review. Everybody's saying, well, that's a big call. As you watch, my wife's going to be in the Harvard Law Review. Her second year, she was in the Harvard Law Review. 
even with those glowing results and she left Harvard because her husband got a job in yep. New York. Yep. She had to go to Columbia. So she changed universities to Columbia, finished her, her tenure as a, as a lawyer, her course, and then she couldn't get a job. No one would hire a female lawyer. And that's, I think, not only she did she feel the discrimination when she was at Harvard, and more so Harvard than Columbia, they say, mm. but uh, then not to be able to get a job as a lawyer because she was a woman really started to ignite her passion for equal rights. Yeah. Her story, I mean, it starts a bit before uni. She had a sister that died when she was a baby. Yep. Her mum died when she was only 17. 17. Yep. And from what I understand, her mum was huge on education and back then education was the most important yep. thing and yep. she was adamant that Ruth was going to be educated and she foregoed her own education and refused went to work to feed the family and I didn't find out till after she died but... She'd been squirrelling away money and she had $8,000 there that Ruth used to enter Cornell University. She wasn't going to have a go to a public school or a, yeah. or a uni. So she'd been through the ringer as a kid. She actually had a child before she started her law degree. That's right. 14-month-old baby when she started she's, the law degree. Her, her, mother, her, mother, her mother said two things to her repetitively. Ooh, yep. just, just two things. And they were always be a lady. The first thing was was always be a lady. And what she meant by that, she goes, don't show your emotions. Don't get angry. Be centred. Understand who you are. Always be a lady. And that second thing was be independent. And she actually, when she met her husband, Marty, she actually spoke to him. And one of the biggest things that made her choose, you know, him as a husband was the fact that he goes, you know, we are equal. When you need to work, I, I can look after the family. When I need to work, you look after the family. And this is something, sort of an agreement they came to well before going to law school because that's where they met at Cornell is where they actually met. story I heard about that is at, at Cornell, the um, male-to-female ratio was five to one. Yeah. So the university actually used to try and play matchmaker and would send guys around to the girls' houses. And apparently he's the first guy that ever got past the first date with yeah. her. Not first base, first, first date. date. Yep. The thing I like, and, and I'd, I obviously I'd heard all the news and I couldn't work out why this woman was so glorified when she died last year because I'd never heard of her before, but the first thing I read was she was very good at a lot of things, but what made her most famous and the reason people revered her so much was her dissension. So she's my type yeah. of girl, mate. She, yeah. she argued with bloody everybody, <coughs> told everyone they were wrong. And, and made a, and, too. It's and, amazing. And, and made a career about breaking down precedents that had been set years and years before. So she might type a chick. Looking into her, she I wanted to find out what. Chick, what oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, looking into her, I wanted to find out why she wanted to become a lawyer. You know what? What was the drive? What was that point that said? You know what? That's that's where I want to do. And it was when um, when the politicians were pointing the finger at all these people in America about communism. And uh, all these lawyers were out there arguing, going, they were allowed to be communists if they want to be communist. You can't discriminate people on their political beliefs. And she was looking at that going, wow, this is amazing. These people are sticking up for these people's beliefs. This is amazing. That's what triggered her to say, well, I'm going to be a lawyer. This is, what, this is what I want to do now. And I thought that was fantastic. And then not only did she want to do it, she did it amazingly. Yeah. Before we get into her nomination for the Supreme Court, she finally became a professor, so she couldn't get a job. Uh, when they went to New York, she couldn't get a job. So she finally got become a professor at one of the major universities, which would allow them to actually practice law at the same time. Yeah. And uh, one of her first cases, which wasn't represented wasn't that guy, one? No. It was uh, the American Air Force, Navy and Army were started bringing female recruits. Yep. The female was not allowed to receive a uh, living away from home allowance like the men were. She goes, well, this is, must be a mistake. They go, well, no, it's only allowed to the men, it's not allowed to the women. So she challenged it and she won. And uh, I think from that case, she was stated in saying that long-lasting change takes a long time. Long-lasting change. Change can be instant, but long-lasting change will take a long time. She goes, this is not an overnight battle, this is a long battle to be had. And I think the next one was the one you were discussing about representing a man. A, a man who was looking after his mother. No, it was his son. So the, the, in the movie, On the Basis of Sex, which is about her, they described it as, as him looking after his mother. Oh, but in real life, this guy's wife died in childbirth. And then he, so he was left his son. And this guy said... We've just sprung him, mate. What? He's done all his research off the movie. 
<laughs> no, right. I don't. You've watched, you've watched RBG. The, the, the I, no, I, I watch a documentary. There's a documentary yeah, called the, the RBG. Documentary so is, doc- is really good. The, that documentary <laughs> talks about yeah. this guy, right? So in the movie, it did say that about his mum, but in the in the documentary, this guy's wife had passed away in childbirth. Yeah, and uh, this guy's perception was, the child's not here for me. I'm here for the child. I have to do everything for this child now. And when he went to get a living at home allowances, whatever you want to call it, uh, carers a pension, carers, yeah, welfare, the government was like, well, that's actually only a, allowed to women. So that's when that court case comes. So, so that's the crazy thing, isn't it? Is that she made her name by looking Defending after... Defending a man. The, the opposite sex. That's right. And that's what... It's on the basis of sex. And then... Uh, in fairness, we need a lot of defending. <laughs> <laughs> My, I don't know. You, I, I think that was a big take. But but also, it, it was, I think, where a shift has started. Because even though yep. her mother had really taught her about controlling her emotions, I don't think that she did. That was the reason reason she got that from her mother because she was out of control, always you know having to stand up for herself. But at that point in time, there was a shift, and it took a shift for her to win that case. Rather than going out there and really attack back and and retaliate, she learned the power of likability, wasn't it? And and <laughs> I, and I think that that that's the important bit is that. Quite often, we, we don't think that being likable is good enough. But even in real estate, when it is being likable, maybe is actually better than being professional. It is probably even being better than having the knowledge of real estate and, and the job. And she won the judges, she won the, uh, the people on the witness, on the uh, jury, mainly because they started to like her. Yeah. She, she knew her stuff. When she stood there and spoke to him, she was very articulate in what she was explaining to him. Up until then, for me, her husband was an incredible man. Yeah. Because, I mean, there's so much you can read about the, the lady. There's so, so much going around. But it is unheard of back in those days to Absolutely. have a man saying, you know what? I'll stay my home. wife is my equal. If you're going to do better than me, I'll stay home. You think about it and go back there. It's unheard yep. of. Sounds Absolutely. like she would have smashed him if he didn't. So <laughs> maybe that have something to do with the forty-four Magnum she was holding at <laughs> the time. <laughs> she wouldn't be able to carry it. Sure, then. darling. When, I'll know, stay home. True well, story. Actually, right now. It, so she got she got nominated for the High Court when Clinton was in power. Right. And that was in '93. She was actually 23, 22, 23 on the list of uh, nominees. So she was right down the list of potential nominees to be nominated by Clinton. The first person he nominated, wanted to nominate, said no. So her husband was obviously within these circles and knew about this. And so he started to go into a campaign mode for his wife and started to be her promotional manager, basically on the on the quiet, speaking to people about how useful his wife would be on the Supreme Court. And all of a sudden, she started to raise in the ranks. So Clinton had this name come across. He goes, oh, this lady's too old and so forth. By then she was 60-odd. He goes, let's have a meeting. Within 15 minutes of talking to her, within 15 minutes, he goes, you are my nomination. He knew it within 15 minutes. And he said there was the best decision, one of the best decisions I've ever made, apart from Monica, um, (laughs) was to nominate her for the High Court. And uh, she, she won 93 to <laughs> Talk about a fierce defender three. of women's rights and you bring up Monica. 96 to oh, 3. 96 what, to did, three. What, did, what did she have to do in the Oval to, to get the nomination? <laughs> Nothing. She just said to sign that piece she of paper. She set back the cause about 50 years. That's what she did. <laughs> One of the stories I love that I picked up was I listened to a podcast on her and, and they started the podcast by telling the story of when they got to Harvard Law, the dean had all the ladies around to his house one evening and it was it's not a Monica Lewinsky story, no. but the, he sat them all down in a circle and then he said, you ladies here are taking the place of men in our legal program. Stand up and explain to me why you should be here instead of giving it to one of our hard-working men who deserve the spot, Monica. And eight people left the room. She stayed and fought and that's... That epitomises. Did you watch the movie? 
No, you assholes. I've been reading and listening, and now I find out there's a documentary and a friggin' movie. So, so there's a movie called Thank You, on Brothers. The basis of brothers, sex. brothers. So on the basis of sex, there's a movie on the basis of sex, which is on Netflix. Great, great movie. It's very loosely sort of directed as so Thomas was Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, but um, you, but RBG. Listen. RBG is the other one, which is the actual documentary. We, we can have a look at all the stories, or we can have a look at her impact. One of the, my question is, this woman here at 86, she died at 87 from pancreatic complication, yeah? yep. cancer complication. Cancer twice? But even cancer though was she, she was 85, 83, 82, whatever, she had more applause from the youth so the generations that are about two generation away from her. Yeah. And and that's the question I, I ask myself is how many of us will be able would be able to sit down with a two generation behind us and still inspire them? You tell me. So this even is though thing, she's five foot. This is the thing I said before, is that she said long lasting change takes time. And she knew that what she was doing today would affect those generations that you're talking about now. And I think some of those things that, that I got out of it was um, not many people in, in any nation can say that they've lived to see the change they've created in the nation. Yeah. And she did. She set precedent after precedent within the courts to challenge unfair laws, and which went on to affect these people that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. She stood by her values very adamantly. Whenever questioned or, or, or uh, tested, no challenge. It was always, I know what I believe in. She was very passionate about what she did and everyone loved the fact that she was so small but had this huge fight, huge presence. Here's a question for you. Barack Obama is in his last year. She's ill. There's a chance that she probably would not have even have made it into the first year of Donald Trump. What, what do you think about her refusing to resign or to retire so that in the Obama times, they could have picked a more democratic, lenient kind of judge on the Supreme Court. Why would she continue and die inside and within the presidency of Donald Trump? Is that selfish? Is that... Uh, look, from what I saw in the documentary, where she sat on the left right wing was very in the middle to start with. And then as new presidents come in, especially Bush, she was pushed more to the liberal and a further away from the conservative side. So... Understanding the lady, and as little as I do from the what of research I've done, she would have stayed there to add balance to probably an unbalanced high she court. She could have given the chance to keep it. One of her dying wishes was to not let Donald Trump pick another <laughs> Supreme Court judge until the new president comes in. Yeah. So, to Thomas's point, she had that opportunity four years prior. They could have done it, and I don't know if she maybe she Trump maybe she didn't prior. realize how bad. Trump was going to be, well, or she, she did. foresaw. She, she actually badmouthed Trump on the yeah. um, during his campaign trail. She actually badmouthed him, and for a high court judge to do that, a supreme not high court, supreme court judge, it's actually a no no uh, because they're going against the constitution and so forth. Do you think that fed into a popularity because at the time she passed, possibly, possibly. it was, and still to this day, it's uh, very popular to be a Trump hater. So not possibly. only was she made all these amazing changes, but timing is everything. And it was very popular, especially in the youth, because the youth are going more and more left every day, a lot yep. of them, to hate Donald Trump. So all that, that side of politics would have had to do is go, oh, this lady doesn't like Trump, of course, the youth and everyone are going to... I don't, I don't know if she would have done it for the popularity, but there is a possibility. Um, I'm saying, do you think that helped? I'm saying, she, did she do it for that? But well, well, she was already in a position, she couldn't move any higher than she was, except for public popularity. And she got to a public popularity where people were creating shirts and caps and all this sort of stuff. And that was Donald so, yeah. Trump. The funny, funny story is that <laughs> MAGA. She I um, defend my boy. <laughs> Come on, Donald. Come on. Well, everyone spoke very highly of her. Um, her kids used to say, "Mum was a great lawyer and a great mum, but a terrible driver and a terrible cook." And her husband actually said the kids banned Ruth from the kitchen because they had taste. <laughs> So, you know, she wasn't perfect in every world, world. But one of the things I would want to pick up, and it's one thing that we talk about here quite a bit, is um, being able to have an opinion, whether it's on social media or amongst each other, 
and still being mates because we've got differing opinions. One of her best friends in life was uh, Justice Kaleja, which was uh, full conservative, and she's Scalia, full. Li- yeah. What was what was his Isn't name? Kalia. Kalia. Scalia. Scalia. Sc- I thought yeah. it was Scalia. Scalia. Scal- Scalia. Anyway, th- he was full yeah. right wing. Yeah, he was, yeah. He, she was full left wing. They were best friends, but they were the best of friends, and uh, she was able to put that aside and still be really good mates. I thought that was absolutely fantastic thing because a lot of people are yeah. unable to do that. If you're not like me, we can't be like. No, the well, saying used to be: don't talk about politics or religion. Now it's don't talk about anything. <laughs> right there, there you go. You literally can't bring anything up that's even close to being a hot topic or, or a, a one where there could be room for debate without being castigated and, and vilified, and you just can't do it anymore. So. That saying needs to change. Oh, you know what they say? Don't talk about religion or politics. You, you literally, yeah. you got to be scared to open your mouth. At the, if 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 you value that, if you value other people's opinions, or if your career is riding on uh, your livelihoods, riding on the opinions of other people, then you got a big decision to make. Do you do you value free speech over the food you put on your table for your kids? I mean, that's a that's a call. That, yeah, we know where most actors are at. They value people's opinions because they just go with what's popular and politicians are the same at the moment politicians are exactly the fucking same they will they don't value free speech they value what the populists think because there's popularity but that has never changed come on man you you really think that things change so let's try and recap from these guys and have a look at some of our the lessons what What do you think your legacy was so you asked the question and i don't have an answer for you what are some of the lessons we can take out for our own lives for our own uh, how do I say it for the our generation or maybe so the next one generation? Of, one because of, one of the things I, I took away from this, someone we often speak about people that should be speaking often do and they shouldn't, yeah, and people that shouldn't be speaking often do and and we hear them and that's not the right words, right? So she was one of these people that we say we would say she needed to speak up, she needed to to advocate for whatever she believed in, and she did. So I think she got behind what she believed in and she forced change with her belief. I think it's know your values and. And, and have a set of values and live your life by them. I mean, what I what I can gather is that she was uncompromising in her absolutely beliefs, and that's that's an awesome way to be. I don't like you probably proved me wrong. I may not have dug deep enough, but she seems to have an opinion on something yep. and go to war for that opinion. And it's changed from what I can gather. It's changed America. I don't know whether it's changed the world or. or what? I don't know what you guys think our legacy is. It's a good is, question you ask. I mean, do you think she's changed America? I think so. I don't, I don't know. I well, mean, beside that case, we, we talked in length about that case, but really, after that case, has she really made big change? So I say, though, she was responsible for the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which, which is that's right. pay discrimination claims for workers. That obviously is a big thing. If that's true, and she had that effect, she did. That, that's a massive thing. Where that was in uh, workers uh, uh, Barack's time. Um, out of the um, six Supreme Court cases that she challenged, she won five of them. There was only one she didn't win, and out of the other five, they were all uh, gender-based sort of challenges. Whether it was pay, but the question is, has she changed the country? I what, think absolutely. But those, how? How? Those those court cases have changed the rulings for people to have better equality within their lifestyle. Yeah. What's your answer? I think that uh, she has. I think she has. But it's not really what inspires me the most. What inspires me the most is if you really look at her story, here's a woman who did better than any man in her class, who did work, her work and the work for her husband, and who never questioned it. If only we could take a little bit of that in our workplace today. That we go to work not to question our employers or question whether we should not be uh, managing directors yet, but we just really give it our best. You know, e- even when she found out that she was not employable because she was a woman, she still gave it her best. And I think that that is a, something that is probably more stoic to me, yeah. is that no matter what your circumstances all you can do is just give it your best one day at a time. And things will unravel right before you if you deserve it. Would you agree, TL, that you talk a lot about passion? Do you think she found it? She found her passion 
and she wasn't going to let anything stop her working in that field. I mean, obviously, to to have all the kickbacks, I mean, we can't imagine. I mean, we can't put ourselves in this time. And actually, I don't mean this. Thomas, you've got Asian blood in you, so you would have experienced yeah. discrimination yeah. that I, I can't say I have yeah. because I'm a, I'm a white person. Someone just asked me the other day, what, you know, what would be the colour of the skin of my baby? So I, <laughs> I just don't know. I mean, oh, I, well, Oprah's calling, mate. You can get on there. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> You know what I mean? Like I was about to say, none of us can put our, ourselves in the shoes of facing that sort of discrimination, but maybe maybe you can. But you've got to be bloody passionate about what you're doing in the face of all that to keep on going. Yeah? Absolutely. Yes, maybe, but as you know that... Maybe like, there's a lesson in that. Passion, passion is the biggest monster of all. You don't need size. You don't need weapon. You've got passion. You can yeah. go all the way, right? But maybe there's a lesson in that. If you find what you're truly passionate about, nothing will stop you. Yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah, I like that. We're lucky yeah, that we live in a world at the moment where even though behind closed doors there might still be some of that discrimination going on, but by and large it's much easier to punch through that wall now than back then where women weren't even allowed into the college. I mean, and, and blacks weren't allowed on the same bus as whites and and all When that. you say it's easier now, yeah. I think it's easier now because of what was done that's in the past right, yeah. by these people. But yeah, that's absolutely. how strong her passion was, absolutely. so I, I think there's a lesson in that. Absolutely. She was asked, when will you be satisfied with your work? And she said, when there's nine women sitting on the high court judge bench. Because there's nine seats. But do you think that then oh, she yeah. has crossed the other side? She says that up until 1981... Well, she was about gender equality, mate. They had four and a so, half women on either so, side. So she said, up until 1981, it was all men. And that was all right up until 1981. Why is it not all right to have all women? Mm, great question, isn't it? Great didn't question. Say it wasn't. Don't look at Better. me like that. Mate, I'm just, you, I mean, you the one that said mate, four and a half it's, women it's, are Listen, it's the most loaded <laughs> question, and I'm not going to dig myself that hole. As a bloke, bloke Chris, who's are you listening? Himself. No, it, it is a loaded question because as, a, as as you're talking about it, all I could think of it was Fernwood. I don't even know where. Right? <laughs> so the before gym Fernwood, over. you know, oh, a woman in the gym where men go? Yeah. No, 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 no. But, mate, try to be a man and go in there and you'll see how fast you'll get ejected. You're right. gone. I was right? gonna. So do we sometimes just cross that line? I, I, I just don't know. Now, here's to end this podcast, though. Why did you pick Ruth? I, I think I touched on it at the beginning. I heard amazing things about her. Rita is a very big advocate for women's rights as well and equal pay for women and all that. So yeah, now we know what. Being in her, being in her position, and I, I wasn't sure who I was going to pick. I did want to put a women in into the fray of us talking about people because we've we've chosen three guys. So I did want to. I was really thinking about why I picked her. I thought it would, it would be someone has achieved great things in such a short period of time, in such a short life, during a time where it was needed. There's, here's a question for the whole. Let's see if I can do it without digging myself a hole, but for the whole topic, should we have to consider the gender of the people who inspire us before we do a podcast? No, is, no. That, is that what the world should be about? or, or you know? No, well, I actually had a couple of women in my mind to talk about. One was Mother Teresa. Um, the other one was Ruth Ginsburg. I'm not saying there's um, not a lot of inspirational women, but the first the first reason you gave at the start was we haven't done a woman yet and I think we need to pay more attention to the women. I, if someone inspires you, they inspire you regardless of gender, yes? As I said also, I didn't know a lot about her. I, I didn't know a lot about her and I knew that she had done amazing things and I wanted to look more and I thought it would be a very good... I'm not saying it's a bad us. choice. No, I'm just saying it, yeah, it, I can was, understand. it was a thing you brought up yep. and, and I don't think we should have to be careful about how many males or how many females we talk about because the idea is that every week someone different picks someone that inspires them. Yeah, yeah, but you know, we, we you can't help but feel that way, though. You know, you watch a movie now, the the judge on the bench usually black now, the uh, the police inspector yeah. is usually a lady in black. I watched and an NFL show. I watched an NFL show on ESPN last week, and the host was female. Two of the three panelists were female, and they yeah. were sitting there trying to tell a guy who'd played twenty years in the NFL about playing in the NFL. <laughs> and I've got no problem with there are some brilliant female there are just as many brilliant female yeah. sports people as there are male sports people but the way we've gone now where and it's the same in rugby league the NRL's doing it now you can sit there and watch an NRL show any night of the week and there's four female panellists telling the greatest player of all time how to play football and even my wife 
who says, what are they doing? Where have we gone to? It's there like, for the sake of, of being there and I think that's a dangerous way to think. I think, you know, I wouldn't sit on an all-male panel trying to tell the captain of the Australian netball team how to play netball because I haven't done it and, and vice versa and I think we've got to be care- – the tokenism – which so is I didn't feel is. I needed to. I feel I wanted to. Okay. Yeah, All that's right. fine. I'm just yeah. asking. I'm asking that question. Is that just to cut it off there? I just didn't feel I needed to. I no, no, to. it's not about. Yeah, it's just. Is that something we should? No, be I think. I think it's a good subject. Is it's, that something it's we should be considering? And I don't think we should. I thought it was a good subject. Thank yeah. you very no, much. Great. Awesome. She's awesome, mate. I love it. Yeah, yeah, no, awesome. uh, listen, mate. We learn, and and this is the thing. Through a life of a great person, you know, you always learn, and. We're only having a bit of a chat about why and how so that we can understand each other's thinking. That's all. 100%. I, I think that was a great subject. No, no, all good. I'm well, asking, no, is that something a, when And in the end, you ne- not, none of us should ever pay attention to Cam anyway. And we're not so. allowed to have opinions anymore <laughs> anyway. So. Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. But what about what? the wine? That's oh, pretty yeah. bloody good. Is that wine better than the white? Oh, come on. We're both red drinkers. Fuck, it's going hands down. No, no. You can't say it's that. It's white, mate. It was good white. I'd go for the red first. I'm time. actually going to trust you on this because I've eaten that much food. Wow, this is fantastic. No, the red is quite nice. Well done with the red. Well done, brother. Last Bye. time, guys. Next Bye. time.